we talked about how the West and the New South were suppliers for what was going on in the North and the Northeast. And what was going on was industrialization and its handmaiden urbanization. Remember, back in those days, people don't have cars. Their primary means of transportation is walking. So when a factory would be built, then housing and stores and that sort of thing would grow up around that factory. That is urbanization. There were a number of things that allowed the United States to industrialize so rapidly in the last part of the 1800s. The development of the corporation, the organization of American business, the rise of industrial statesmen, powerful men who put all the pieces together, a popular philosophy that allowed the industrialists to do what they did, a growing pool of workers or labor, which was supplied in large part by immigrants, either immigrants from rural America or immigrants from other parts of the world. All of this culminated in the growth of cities. This video gives you an overview of the growth of the factory known as industrialization in the United States. Building a business, or in this case, an industry, requires a number of things, capital or money, workers or labor, technology, particularly new technologies, new ways of manufacturing, communications, communications whether it be for deliveries or for sending your goods to market, raw materials, and this is where the West comes in, and finally markets, someone who wants to buy the stuff that you're making. These are necessary to build a business. Much of the capital or money to build these new factories and these new industries was generated by government spending on the Civil War. The Civil War was costing the government about $2.5 million a day. So the federal spending helped people build factories to su supply goods for the war. And they made a profit. And so they had more money then to invest in expansion or new industries. Factories need workers. And so as the factories grew, they need more and more workers. Now, some of these workers did come from rural America, but millions of them came by way of immigration. Between 1836 and 1914, 30 million people immigrated to the United States from Europe. Another 300,000 Chinese came to America. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, the pattern of immigration changed somewhat. Before the Civil War, most immigrants from Europe came from Northern Europe, from Protestant countries like Germany, England, Scotland. After the war, however, the vast majority of the immigrants came from Southern and Eastern Europe. And these were primarily Catholics and Jews, not Protestants. They were coming from areas like Greece, Italy, Poland, and Russia. 
And so they were more diverse in their backgrounds than the previous immigrants to America had been. Another development that cleared the way for the explosion of industrial America was actually a Supreme Court ruling. In 1886, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations were legally protected like people. They were accorded due process of law, equal protection under the law. In other words, these Supreme Court rulings made corporations have the same rights as you and I as individuals. What this meant for industrialization was that as long as the uh, industrial leader was doing something in the name of the corporation, he was not personally responsible. If someone was killed or hurt or had to uh, wanted to sue, they could not sue the president of the company. They could only sue the company. And therefore, and you can't throw a company in jail, so therefore it was just money. And so building in the price of lawsuits just became part of the corporate culture in America and corporate personhood protected the individuals who were running the companies from being held responsible for the actions of those companies. The first big business in the United States was the railroad. Look at this map of the railroad lines that existed at the beginning of the Civil War in 1860. There were a few, but you'll notice that most of them run east and west, not north and south. Compare that with the next slide. Here's a map of the railroad lines in 1900, just 40 years after that previous map. Now stop and think what it takes to build a railroad line. You have to have money. You have to have workers, but you also have to have iron or steel for the rails. You have to have uh, logs or timber for the uh, ties in the railroad. You have to have railroad equipment like the steam engines and the railroad cars. All of those kinds of things. Well, think what it would take to get your necessary things to build your railroad to the right place at the right time. This is one of the magical things that the industrialists were able to do. They were able to put together systems, systems that allowed them to build on a consistent schedule. So if you're gonna build the, the uh, Fort Worth to Arlington Railroad line, you might need rails. Well, but to make those rails, some steel mill is gonna have to get the raw material, iron ore. They're gonna have to get coal to not only heat the uh, mills, but also to use in making steel. Then they have to make the steel, then it has to be delivered to where it's needed and when it's needed. In other words, supply chain, that has become the popular term these days. And that's what the industrialists were able to do, create these supply chains, create these systems that allowed them to, big, to build big business. And building the railroads, as we talked about with the Transcontinental Railroad, was mostly done by the muscle power of men. They unloaded the cars by hand. They carried those two-ton rails to where they were gonna be installed. They used picks and shovels to smooth out the roadbed. 
this was very, very labor intensive, and the labor was done by low paid construction workers. It took big money to take on these big construction projects. And money began to pour in when Edison, Thomas Alva Edison, invented the stock ticker in 1880. This allowed the telegram to be about numbers. And so the New York Stock Exchange, the stock market, could now be invested in from all over the world. It was no longer local to just the New York area. And so now you could sit in San Francisco, invest on Wall Street, and through the stock ticker, follow your investments and send messages to sell or buy. This greatly increased the amount of money available to the industrialists to build these large construction projects like factories and railroads. Another factor to remember about industrialization is that it was powered by coal, not oil or gas, not by electricity. They didn't have electricity yet. It was powered by coal. And so coal mining becomes absolutely essential to the industrialization of the United States. But again, you see the need for that system. The miners break their backs, digging the coal out, loading it onto cars. But then where does it go? Well, there has to be a system, the railroad system that takes it to where it is going to be used and sold. New inventions were vital to these processes. For instance, we don't think about air brakes as being that important, but before George Westinghouse invented them, to stop a train, the engine had to slow down gradually, timing it to where they were just barely moving when they reached their destination. If the engine slowed down too quickly, the cars behind it, which didn't have any brakes on them, would just pile into the engine and knock the whole train off the rails. Now, they did come up with individual braking for the cars, but they were mechanical. A brakeman had to run along the, the car tops and jump from car to car as the train was moving and turn a big wheel to apply the brakes to each individual car. Well, Westinghouse solved that problem. Now you had air brakes. Think of an 18-wheeler. You hear them brake and you hear the air go pshh. Those are the air brakes. When the driver in the cab hits the brakes, it not only breaks the cab, but it also breaks the wheels on the trailer. Well, that's what air brakes did for the railroads. Now, when the engineer applied the brakes in the engine cab, brakes were applied to all of the cars. This made it much easier and quicker to stop a train. They didn't have to spend an hour slowing down before they came into a station. Also, it allowed the trains to pull more cars because you didn't have to worry about all that weight knocking the engine off the tracks. So just things that we don't even think about made possible the rapid industrialization of the United States. And the use of steam to power things like printing presses allowed for the cheap production of printed goods. 
One of the reasons you could have dime novels, for example, is that now you had printing presses being driven by steam engines and it made printing much cheaper, faster, and thus much more available. We talked about how refrigerated rail cars revolutionized the meatpacking industry when we talked about Fort Worth. Now, these meatpacking plants could be located wherever, and they could slaughter their animals, and then using refrigeration, shift those that meat to market. Alexander Graham Bell's work with the telephone revolutionized the way we communicate. Before this, the fastest way to communicate was by telegram. Now, in 1880, he can make a long distance call from New York to Chicago. This is another invention that greatly impacts the way the industrialists are able to build big business in the United States. But once again, I want you to think about the system that it took to string that telephone line, to put up the telephone poles, to manufacture the wire, to manufacture the telephone equipment. Alexander Graham Bell was able to put that all under one company, and he called it American Telephone and Telegraph, or AT&T. AT&T was founded in 1895. It's one of many, many brands that you know to this day that was established and built during this era. Any of you who had burgers and fries recently, you probably put some ketchup on it. Heinz built his company by pasteurizing his products so that they were safe for people to eat. They didn't get sick. Before this, you could buy bottled or canned food, but you never knew whether it was any good or not, whether it would make you sick. What put Heinz on the map was the safety of his food because everything was pasteurized before it was put into containers. Since nobody likes chocolate, this is probably a, just a throwaway slide, but during this era, Hershey founded his chocolate company in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He built a whole town. Hershey was built on milk chocolate that was made from milk. He invented a process that allowed him to make chocolate candy, package it, and ship it all over the country. Standard Oil was founded in 1899 by John D. Rockefeller. You may not know the name Standard Oil today, but you know the company it has become, that would be Exxon. One of the major surges forward was the harnessing of electricity in the 1890s. You had two competing formats. You had AC current, which was developed by a guy named Tesla for Westinghouse. And he had DC current that was developed by Edison. And he was backed by the financier JP Morgan. And they had a battle, 
over which would become the standard for electric power. Edison invented the electric chair, trying to prove that Westinghouse and Tesla's AC current was dangerous. But Westinghouse's DC current won the day in large measure because he got the contract to electrify, as it was called, the Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago. This was a World's Fair that was designed to show off all the new technologies that America was inventing. And one of these was electrification. Westinghouse went in, strung the wire, hung the light bulbs, so that even at night, people could attend this World's Fair. I want you to stop and think for a second. You're living in Chicago. You're using kerosene lamps to light your home. One night you decide, I'm going to go and see this thing out there called the Columbian Exposition. And so you turn down your lamp, you step out your front door, and it's mostly dark. Maybe there's a gas light on the corner or something like that, but it's pretty dark. But off on the horizon, it looks like daytime. And as you walk toward it, your mouth just drops open. And how can so much light be created? That was the electrification that won for Westinghouse. His AC current is now the standard. Every time you turn on your computer, you turn on a light, you're using AC current. It had a great advantage over DC in that it could be transmitted a lot farther. And it won that war, but it was a war, competing against other formats. The industrialists used two major strategies to put together their powerful companies. One was called horizontal integration. Standard Oil was famous for this. Standard Oil would either control by ownership or by power. All of the different functions it took to produce oil from the ground, to refine oil, to sell oil. So they own the oil fields, they own the refineries, they own the uh, pipelines that delivered the products. And as, if you've ever seen an Exxon station, back then they even owned the point of sale. And if anybody tried to interfere with their monopoly, they even would take action against that competition. For example, when the railroads tried to jack the rates that Rockefeller was having to pay to ship his oil, he built the first pipeline to overcome this impediment. If a bank was wanting to finance some competitor, Rockefeller would just buy the bank. There were even some instances where people who owned oil wells didn't want to settle for what Rockefeller was willing to pay for a barrel of oil. They tried to go on the open market. And they quickly discovered that not only did Rockefeller own the pipelines and the railroad cars, but also the refineries. And if they still wouldn't give in, there might just be some kind of explosion in their oil field. 
this was horizontal integration, owning all of the aspects of the business and anything that contributed to it, driving out the competitors. The industrialists did not believe in competition. They believed competition was bad. And so Rockefeller and Standard Oil used horizontal integration to buy up or bankrupt any competitor. The other strategy that they used to build monopolies was called vertical integration. This is a picture of Andrew Carnegie building from the ground up. Andrew Carnegie became the most powerful steel producer in the world. He owned the mines that produced the coal. He owned the mines that produced the iron ore. He owned the railroads that delivered those to his factories. He owned those steel mills that made those raw materials into steel. And then he owned the point of sale. So he owned everything from the ground, from the raw material, to where he sold it on the open market. This is vertical integration. Now the industrialists did not just use one or the other, they used both. But as this diagram depicts, both strategies basically cut out the competition and allowed the industrialists to build virtual monopolies in their given fields, whether it be oil, meat packing, steel, whatever it might be. These were the two basic strategies they used to build colossal companies. I'm going to refer to these business leaders as the industrialists. John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Cornelius Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan were the most famous. Rockefeller had a monopoly in petroleum and oil, Carnegie in steel and iron, Vanderbilt in the railroads, and J.P. Morgan in finance. These four men competed for who would be the wealthiest man in the country. They competed for power. And in doing so, they built industrial America. As this video shows, these industrialists became legends in America. They were the ones that had the guts to put it all together. But they often did it in a very unscrupulous way, a very cruel way. And as this video shows, they were out for power and money. That was their bottom line. And they didn't really care how they got it. And so the question has always come up, are these robber barons who were robbing from all of the workers that work for low wages and in dangerous conditions? Or are these the tycoons of industry that should be idealized? Some of them, were true rags to riches stories. Rockefeller and Carnegie. Others like Vanderbilt and particularly J.P. Morgan came for money and just made more. But in some ways, these industrialists become the symbols of America, of the self-made man, of the rags to riches story that is so part uh, so much a part of the american belief system but should we celebrate them or criticize them 
They were robber barons in that they exploited labor. They corrupted government. They created monopolies and squashed competition whenever they could. They uh, used unfair business practices. They used stock manipulation, fraud, anything they could do to increase their power. But on the other hand, they were the driving forces between this organization of business that I talked about, the creation of these systems, the creation of, econo of economies of scale, where bigger created more, more cheaply, and thus made it affordable to everyday people. They did industrialize America. In fact, some historians have said that the United States would not have won World War I or World War II if it had not been for what the industrialists did in the 1880s and 90s. Because it was American industrial might, more than American manpower, that helped to win those two wars. They made incredible amounts of money, much more than any millionaire, billionaire you think of today, like Bezos or Bill Gates. They were 10 times, 20 times more wealthy. And they began, some in their later years, some their descendants, to become significant philanthropists, giving money to, law, to good, just causes. And finally, they created the modern infrastructure. Again, the system, the railroad systems, the road systems that helped create modern America. One of the reasons why the American people came to look up to the industrialist was a philosophy called social Darwinism. As you could probably tell by the name, the Darwinism suggests that some species are better than others. And in the late 19th century, there was the general belief among the American people that because they got rich, that meant they were just better than others. There was nothing that caused you to be poor except yourself. It was not anything that the system did to you or genetics did to you. It was a matter of evolution and that these industrialists deserved to be where they were because they were superior to the average man. And industrialist social Darwinism was a great rationale for why they were rich and others were poor. It was because they were the fittest, survival of the fittest. In fact, John D. Rockefeller said, God gave me my money implying that it was God's will because of his ability that he be wealthy and powerful. We still have part of that belief system today, what has become known as the prosperity gospel. People like T.D. Jakes at Potter's House and uh, the guy down in Houston. They basically teach God wants you to be rich. And it's a very short leap from that to if you're not rich, it's because God doesn't like you. And if you are rich, it's because God likes you. So even today, there are elements of this social Darwinism. Does God want you to be rich? 
the implication being that if you're not rich, it's because you have done something wrong in God's eyes. And if you are rich, then God is blessing you. This philosophy of hard work, thrift, perseverance, spread throughout the American culture. In books like McGuffey's Readers, now, I don't know how many of you remember your first grade reader, the very first book that you used in school to try to learn to read. I remember mine, it was fun with Dick and Jane, and it had sentences like, see Spot run, Spot was their dog. Uh, run, Spot, run. Well, in the 1800s, the pretty standard reading book for school children was called the McGuffey's Readers. And they had different levels for different reading skills, but they shared something in common. And that was that the stories that the children read always had a moral to them. For example, here is the text of one of these McGuffey's readers used by school children all over the United States. Check out the moral lesson. The little boy wants the dog to go play, but the dog says, no, I must not be idle. The little boy goes to the bird, hey, come on bird, let's go play. No, I must not be idle. The horse says the same thing. And so the little boy thought with himself, what? Is nobody idle? Then little boys must not be idle. So he made haste and went to school and learned his lessons very well. And the master said he was a very good boy. Okay, you're learning to read by reading this, but think of the morality that it's teaching. Idleness is bad, hard work is good. This just reinforces the idea of social Darwinism. Here's the text of another story for McGuffey's readers. For those of you who thought body image was something new, read this. You'll see that it existed back in the 1800s. The story of the greedy girl who eats too much. It points out that kitten doesn't eat too much. Bees are wiser because they don't eat too much. They put stuff away. Squirrels don't eat all the acorns. They hide them away for winter. And then number eight, I do not love little girls who eat too much. Do you, my little reader? I do not think they have such rosy cheeks or such bright eyes or such sweet, happy tempers as those who eat less. Okay, now you're reading along this as your reading lesson. But what is the moral lesson that it's teaching? Teaching about self-discipline, about putting things away, saving things, thrift. And these are the primary ways to success in the Gilded Age. A person who succeeds, works hard, is thrifty, is self-disciplined. And if you're not those things, then boom, you're going to fail, and it's all your fault. And so these lessons were spread through the school children in the stories they read in learning to read with the McGuffey's readers. Other writings that reinforced this idea of hard work and perseverance and thrift as the way to succeed were the Horatio Alger novels. These were the most popular fiction of the day. 
and all of them were basically stories about poor boy makes good. Remember, Rockefeller and uh, Vanderbilt and Carnegie were all poor boys made good. How did they do it? They would tell you through hard work, thrift, intelligence, all of these skill sets that they used. And if you didn't use yours, then you were going to fail. And that failure was your own fault. And so the Horatio Alger novels, Rags to Riches, become the standard for what Americans believe. For example, one of the Horatio Alger series was about a, a little boy named Ragged Dick who came to the city penniless, but he didn't beg for money. He went out and found him a box that somebody had thrown away and he found him some shoeshine equipment that was in the garbage. And he washed the rag and he cleaned the brush and he set up his box and began shining people's shoes. And from that, he became successful. Rags to riches through your own hard work, your own thrift, your own innovation, your own self-discipline. These were the characteristics that American culture said differentiated between the successful and those who were poor. There could be no other reason. And so social Darwinism provides a very good rationale for those who do succeed as to why they're successful and why poor people are poor. It's their own damn fault. The other guiding principle that allowed the industrialists to build such massive industries and corporations is a term called laissez-faire. It is the idea that government should not interfere in the economy. We still have this to this day. Whenever someone, usually a Republican, talks about getting government off the back of business or decreasing regulations. They're talking laissez-faire. And for the industrialists, this was great because it kept them free to do pretty much whatever they wanted without government interference. And so the other principle besides social Darwinism that allowed for the rapid industrialization of the United States was that government stayed out of the way and let these guys do whatever they wanted to do. That's called laissez-faire. According to Joseph Wharton, who you might know because he has one of the most prestigious business schools in the country at the University of Pennsylvania called the Wharton School because he gave money to them. What should the role of government be? Basically, is I have a man who enables a nation to survive even the afflicted, wrong-headed, cranky legislators. He is the one, not the legislators, who is dictating what government should do. And another of the industrialists, Hollis Huntington, put it very bluntly. If the government tries to get in the way, here's what the industrialist should do. If, if you have to pay money to have the right thing done, it's only just and fair that you do it. If a man has the power but won't do the right thing unless he is bribed, then a man's duty is to go up and bribe him. This is one of the characteristics of these industrialists. They believe that government should work for them and that they could, should control the government. And if they had to bribe 
a legislator or a whole legislature to do what they wanted, that was perfectly okay. That was standard business practice in the late 1800s.